just want to just want to thank the organizers and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. John, uh, uh, for your insights that you shared with us today. I'm going to ask you a question that I it's a similar question to what I asked you last time when you and uh, uh, Mr. Hamza spoke. And uh, it was uh, around the, the, the Quran. Uh, I know I, I think I asked you last time if you had uh, engaged in it or read it, and I believe you said no. Correct me if I'm wrong. And at, at uh, that time, at that time, yeah, I hadn't read it, and I have not read very much of it since. Uh, okay. Um, so, so it's it's I guess so. The, uh, it, what from the Islamic texts has personally resonated with you, and um, uh, what questions would you like to explore further? I do have a second question about around uh, your beliefs around God, but I, I'll wait. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm glad>. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one, I mean, um, I, 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 I haven't read a lot of the Quran, and I don't want to pretend that I have. I, I've just read snippets here and there. I've been reading a lot about um, Islamic philosophy. Um, um, I've been especially reading it through the work of uh, Corbin. Uh, Corbin was um, uh, 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 he was part of the circle of people like Carl Gustav Jung and others. And Corbin was making an argument. He was trying to bridge between Heideggerian phenomenology and Persian philosophy, and he was making a strong argument uh, for the importance that Persia had placed in philosophical history because it acted as a connecting place between European philosophy on one side and Indian, Southern, Asian philosophy on the other. And so I've been, uh, uh, I've been reading a lot of that. And I've been very, uh, and so I've been also reading, I, I, and I'm not gonna try and pronounce his name because it's a, I would mispronounce it, but he was a Persian a philosopher and mystic and he wrote, he wrote um, I believe the English translation is something like the way of illumination. And why I'm particularly interested in it, he talks about knowing by presence something that has been invoked here and something that I've been arguing about. And he was, uh, he, 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 and, and so the idea of illumination is not to primarily develop more and more sophisticated chains of belief, but to uh, being about a transformation of consciousness and cognition, so you get an increasingly sense, an increasing sense of the realness of things in terms of how they are present, to, uh, because you have that sense of presence. And so I found that particularly, wow, because that really jives with a lot of the cog sci that I'm doing right now, and I found that really, really insightful. And then Corbin is talking about people like that and referring to them because Corbin is introducing this term which he calls the imaginal. The, imagine, the imaginary is the mental images you have in your head, right? And then we have sort of the formal patterns of reality. The imaginal are the patterns between us and the world. Let me, let me try and give you an example. Uh, uh, like what's an, an example of the imaginal as opposed to the imaginary? Suppose that, let's say, here's something we care about, justice. I want you to hold justice in your mind. I want, to make, I want you to make justice present in your mind. What do you do? Justice, justice, justice. <laughs> so what many people do, because you know, I do this all the time, is they'll imagine the woman with the scales, with the balance. And why? Like, what, like, it's weird, well, because, when, when balance is actually what you, like when I'm moving around and I'm balancing, I'm actually using the cerebellum, right? It's, it's actually giving my balance. But what I could do by having this symbol right, of justice, I can hold justice in my mind by picturing the lady with the scales. I can then activate my balance machinery and then I can feel what it's like to be balancing things and that part of the cerebellum that you use when you're physically balancing, you also use it when you're trying to balance complex ab uh, abstract relations between people and systems. You're using the same cognitive machinery. So you're enacting a symbol that engages, and so you, you don't just think about justice, you don't just picture it, you're enacting justice, you're embodying it, you're making it happen in you. That's the imaginal. And that, that's how you're making justice present. There's a deep connection between knowing by presence, and again, this symbolic, serious play. And that's really, that's, that's having a deep influence on my thought right now. Thank you, sir. So, the second part of my question was uh, about God. Because this, this lecture is entitled God, 
And I did feel like last time you were hesitant to. Uh, I'm always talk. hesitant to talk. About <laughs> so, so that's exactly my question because um, you said some beautiful things, sir, about uh, our cognitive abilities, and you were yep. very certain about them. And uh, you were, you know, you really phrased them quite nicely. I don't know. I'm certain. I, I think that's I, too strong, but okay. I think they're plausible. I even know that, and, and I know you've had discussions with Dr. Jordan Peterson as well too. Yep. Some have re recently had discussions. I'm not saying anything negative or positive about him. Some have had discussions about him that he's also. Uh, quite long-winded or prefaces, you know, has this long discussion. He doesn't want to state which um, sure. group of people he belongs to, or he didn't, perhaps doesn't want to be affiliated with a label. But I feel that that has, with, respectfully, I feel that has a tendency from yourself, and I would like to know why that is, um, um, if it's possible. I, I know, I don't know, I don't want to assume your background. I know that you teach courses on Buddhism, but sure. why is there this hesitancy to say, okay, there is a God, there is a divine reality? Okay, well, I'm going to answer your question from the way it's framed it. I'm not going to try and answer the question about whether, I'm not going to try and establish to you whether God exists or not. I think that's pretentious on my part. Um, I, uh, so that, I don't think, I'm going to answer the question the way you framed it. Why is there hesitancy on my part? Okay, is that fair enough? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I answer that first, and then you can come back, okay? Because, but I think, well, let me try first, because it might go towards why you're still suspicious. Um, first of all, I agree with you that I, I don't think Jordan should, I don't, I don't think he should dodge the question, okay? So I'll, I'll put my cards on the table because that's what you're asking for me. You're asking for, for me to be honest. I'm a non-theist, okay, which is neither a theist nor an atheist. A non-theist says that they reject the, sh the shared presuppositions between at least classical theism and, and, and atheism, right? Uh, that God is a kind of being, that the relationship to him is one of belief, um, that God is, is in some important ways similar to person, etc. Now why? Why do, I, why do I reject that? But let me then tell you why I, I'm not an atheist too. Okay? Why do I reject that? Because I have, for me, I have practiced deeply in multiple traditions. It's like, you know, arguing, you know, if you've never been to Spain, and somebody tells you, like, you know, you know, Spain is wonderful. Well, how do you, how do you? But if some, Spain is better than France, but if you, they've never left Spain, Spain is better than France, but I've never left. But if I've been to both Spain and Spain and France, and I say Spain is better than France, you pay better attention to me. So I'm, get, I'm so I've, I've practiced in many traditions, and I've had profound transformations and experiences of sacredness. Now, what do I mean by sacredness? Now, this may, I don't know what your particular conception of God is. I know that many mystics talk about God this way. My experience is a very Neoplatonic experience in the, in the sense that what I mean by sacredness is uh, there is an aspect to reality that like, realness always has a moreness to it. it is, there's an inexhaustibleness to it. it that, 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 I, I cannot, through insight, exhaust the depths of what can be discovered or uncovered about even this, this object right here. Everything, like, like Blake said, you can see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. You can hold infinity in the palm of your hand and spend eternity in an hour. I've had those experiences, but I've had them while doing Taoist practice, while doing while deep in meditation. And, and, and that inexhaustibleness is not like a, a random chaos. It's an inexhaustible fount of new intelligibility. So I, I think for that reason, and again, and I've seen things in the Islamic traditions that say things like this. And I don't know if it's heretical to so I don't mean any offense. But, I, you know, God is no thing. There's the no-thingness of God. God is not any kind of thing. And so I think that, that part of for example, like what makes a video game more real to people is if it has that moreness, that they can keep uncovering more, and when they, when they uncover more, it makes more sense to them. So for me, science actually points that out about reality. The, the, the people like Dawkins, that Hamza rightly criticizes, are idolatrous. And, and I use that term seriously. Like this set of beliefs is done, that's it. My experience is, is oh, what science shows is that reality, reality, like the Tao Te Chen says about the Tao, it is a well that is used but never used up. And so I've had radical experiences that transformed, experiences of overwhelming oneness, what I properly call you know, mystical. I've had many of these, 
And when I compare them to people in various traditions, and, and I don't mean just abstractly, I mean in close, respectful discussion, there seems to be deep resonance, mutual understanding. But I cannot find any tradition that I can privilege that for. So I'm a non-theist. Now, that's why I'm hesitant. I don't want, and, and, and this is what I want to say as well. I believe strongly, given what I just said, I think, in fact, I think it's an implication of what I'm arguing for, that there, there are things that will be symbolic for a particular tradition that are indispensable for that tradition to, to experience the sacred. Let me give you an analogy of what I mean. English is indispensable to me. If you take it away from me, I can't, I can't think of reason. Does that mean I think that everybody has to speak English in order to be a cognitive agent? No. But it's indispensable to me. I can't, I literally can't live without it. But that's not the same as concluding that everybody has to be speaking English to be a cognitive agent. That's my reason for being a non-theist. Because, right, and, and by the way, as a scientist, the, the, the evidence lines up with this. People, and we have all kinds of measures for this, so you'll just have to trust me on this, because, right? Uh, you know, of how wise people are becoming. Now, what's, what's, a, what's a strong prediction of how wise you become? Path immersion how much you commit to a spiritual path and stick to it. All the spiritual traditions outperform the atheists in the ability to become wiser. But what you don't find is any significant difference between the various paths and how wise the people come, become within them. You have to commit. You have to immerse yourself in the path because that reliably does better than the non-spiritual people, than the people who self-declare as atheists. It does. But the Buddhists and the Muslims, neither one outperforms the other. So from my point of view, it's like I don't, I, 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 I can't conclude that this, but I can also conclude why, and this is why, I, and I mean this sincerely, why I deeply respect people in the tradition. From my point of view, I know you're not going to agree with what I'm going to say, but I'm explaining my position. From my point of view, your secret symbols very likely are deeply indispensable to you, and you cannot live without them, and that's why I do not trespass against them. That's my answer. So I'm not giving a Jordan answer. I'm not dodging. I'm telling you why, why, what I believe and why I believe. And I'm also trying to explain to you why I really do respect what you have 